the forms of warlike heroism. The fundamental principle underlying all justifications of war from the point of view of human personality is heroism. War, it is said, offers man the opportunity to awaken the hero who sleeps within him. War breaks the routine of comfortable life by means of its severe ordeals. It offers a transfiguring knowledge of life, life according to death. The moment the individual succeeds in living as a hero, even if it is the final moment of his earthly life, weighs infinitely more on the scale of values than a protracted existence spent consuming monotonously among the trivialities of cities. From a spiritual point of view, these possibilities make up for the negative and destructive tendencies of war, which are one-sidedly and tendentiously highlighted by pacifist materialism. War makes one realize the relativity of human life, and therefore also the law of a more than life, and thus war has always an anti-materialist value, a spiritual value. Such considerations have indisputable merit, and cut off the chattering of humanitarianism, sentimental grizzling, the protests of the champions of the immortal principles, and of the international of the heroes of the pen. Nevertheless, it must be acknowledged that, in order to define fully the conditions under which the spiritual aspect of war actually becomes apparent, it is necessary to examine the matter further, and to outline a sort of phenomenology of warrior experience, distinguishing various forms and arranging them hierarchically so as to highlight the aspect which must be regarded as paramount for the heroic experience. To arrive at this result, it is necessary to recall a doctrine with which the regular readers of Diorama will already be familiar, which, bear in mind, is not the product of some particular personal philosophical construction, but rather that of actual data, positive and objective in nature. It is the doctrine of the hierarchical quadripartition, which interprets most recent history as an involutionary fall from each of the four hierarchical degrees to the next. This quadripartition, it must be recalled, is what, in all traditional civilizations, gave rise to four different castes, the slaves, the bourgeois middle class, the warrior aristocracy, and bearers of a pure spiritual authority. Here, caste does not mean, as most assume, something artificial and arbitrary, but rather the place where individuals sharing the same nature, the same type of interest and vocation, the same primordial qualification, gather. A specific truth, a specific function, defines the castes in their normal state and not vice versa. This is not therefore a matter of privileges and ways of life being monopolized on the basis of a social constitution more or less artificially and unnaturally maintained. The underlying principle behind all the formative institutions in such societies, at least in their more authentic historical forms, is that there does not exist one simple universal way of living one's life, but several distinct spiritual ways, appropriate respectively to the warrior, the bourgeois and the slave, and that when the social functions and distributions actually correspond to this articulation, there is, according to the classic expression, in order secundum equum et bonum, according to truth and justice. This order is hierarchical in that it implies a natural dependence of the inferior ways of life on the superior ones and, along with dependence, cooperation. The task of the superior is to attain expression and personhood on a purely spiritual basis. Only such cases in which this straight and normal relationship of subordination and cooperation exists are healthy, as is made clear by the analogy of the human organism, which is unsound if, by some chance, the physical element, slaves, or the element of vegetative life, bourgeois, or that of the uncontrolled animal will, warriors, takes the primary and guiding place in the life of a man and is sound only when spirit constitutes the central and ultimate point of reference for the remaining faculties, which, however, are not denied a partial autonomy, with lives and subordinate rights of their own within the unity of the whole. Since we are not talking just about any old hierarchy, but about true hierarchy, which means that what is above and rules is really what is superior, it is necessary to refer to systems of civilization in which, at the center, there is a spiritual elite and the ways of life of the slaves, the bourgeois, and the warriors derive their ultimate meaning and supreme justification from reference to the principle which is the specific heritage of this spiritual elite, 
and manifest this principle in their material activity. However, an abnormal state is arrived at if the center shifts, so that the fundamental point of reference, instead of being the spiritual principle, is that of the servile caste, the bourgeois or the warriors. Each of these castes manifests its own hierarchy and a certain code of cooperation, but each is more unnatural, more distorted, and more subversive than the last until the process reaches its limit, that is, a system in which the vision of life characteristic of the slaves comes to orient everything and to imbue itself with all surviving elements of social wholeness. Politically, this involutionary process is quite visible in Western history, and it can be traced through into the most recent times. States of the aristocratic and sacred type have been succeeded by monarchical warrior states, to a large extent already secularized, which in turn have been replaced by states ruled by capitalist oligarchies, bourgeois or merchant caste. And finally, we have witnessed tendencies towards socialist, collectivist, and proletarian states, which have culminated in Russian Bolshevism, the caste of the slaves. This process is paralleled by transitions from one type of civilization to another, from one fundamental meaning of life to another. In each phase, every concept, every principle, every institution assumes a different meaning, reflecting the worldview of the predominant caste. This is also true of war, and thus we can approach the task we originally set ourselves, of specifying the varieties of meaning which battle and heroic death can acquire. War has a different face, in accordance with its being placed under the sign of one or another of the castes. While in the cycle of the first caste, war was justified by spiritual motives, and showed clearly its value as a path to supernatural accomplishment and the attainment of immortality by the hero, this being the motive of the holy war. In the cycle of the warrior aristocracies, they fought for the honor and power of some particular prince, to whom they showed a loyalty which was willingly associated with the pleasure of war for war's sake. With the passage of power into the hands of the bourgeois, there was a deep transformation. At this point, the concept of the nation materializes and democratizes itself, and an anti-aristocratic and naturalistic conception of the homeland is formed, so that the warrior is replaced by the soldier citizen, who fights simply for the defense or the conquest of land. Wars, however, generally remain slyly driven by supremacist motives or tendencies originating within the economic and industrial order. Finally, the last stage, in which leadership passes into the hands of the slaves, has already been able to realize, in Bolshevism, another meaning of war, which finds expression in the following characteristic words of Lenin, quote, The war between nations is a childish game, preoccupied by the survival of a middle class which does not concern us. True war, our war, is the world revolution for the destruction of the bourgeois and the triumph of the proletariat, end quote. Given all this, it is obvious that the term hero is a common denominator which embraces very different types of meanings. The readiness to die, to sacrifice one's own life, may be the sole prerequisite, from the technical and collectivist point of view, but also from the point of view of what today, rather brutally, has come to be referred to as cannon fodder. However, it is also obvious that it is not from this point of view that war can claim any real spiritual value as regards to the individual. Once the latter does not appear as fodder, but as a personality, as is the Roman standpoint. The latter standpoint is only possible provided that there is a double relationship of means to ends. That is to say when, on the one hand, the individual appears as a means with respect to a war and its material ends, but simultaneously when a war, in its turn, is a means for the individual as an opportunity or path for the end of his spiritual accomplishment, favored by heroic experience. There is then a synthesis, an energy, and with it, an utmost efficiency. If we proceed with this train of thought, it becomes rather clear from what has been said above that not all wars have the same possibilities. This is because of analogies, which are not merely abstractions, but which act positively along paths invisible to most people. Between the collective character predominating in the various cycles of civilization and the element which corresponds to this character in the whole of the human entity, if, in the eras of the merchants and slaves, forces prevail which correspond to the energies which define man's pre-personal, physical, instinctive, telluric, organic, vital part, then, in the eras of the warriors and spiritual leaders, 
forces find expression which correspond respectively to what in man is character and volitional personality, and what in him is spiritualized personality, personality realized according to its supernatural destiny. Because of all the transcendent factors it arouses in them, it is obvious that, in a war, the majority cannot but collectively undergo an awakening, corresponding more or less to the predominant influence within the order of the causes which has been most decisive for the outbreak of that war. Individually, the heroic experience then leads to different points of arrival, more precisely, to three primary such points. These points correspond, basically, to three possible types of relation in which the warrior caste and its principle can find themselves with respect to the other manifestations already considered. In the normal state, they are subordinate to the spiritual principle. And then there breaks out a heroism, which leads to supra-life, to supra-personhood. The warrior principle may, however, construct its own form, refusing to recognize anything as superior to it. And then the heroic experience takes on a quality which is tragic, insolent, steel-tempered, but without light. Personality remains and strengthens, but at the same time, so does the limit constituted by its naturalistic and simply human nature. Nevertheless, this type of hero shows a certain greatness, and naturally, for the types hierarchically inferior to the warrior, i.e. the bourgeois and the slave types, this war and this heroism already mean overcoming, elevation, accomplishment. The third case involves a degraded warrior principle, which has passed into the service of hierarchically inferior elements, the caste beneath it. In such cases, heroic experience is united almost fatally to an evocation and an eruption of instinctual, subpersonal, collective, irrational forces, so that there occurs basically a lesion and a regression of the personality of the individual, who can only live life in a passive manner, driven either by necessity or by the suggestive power of myths and passionate impulses. For example, the notorious stories of Remarque reflect only possibilities of this latter kind. They recount the stories of human types who, driven to war by fake idealisms, at last realize that reality is something very different. They do not become base nor deserters, but all that impels them forward throughout the most terrible tests are elemental forces, impulses, instincts, and reactions, in which there is not much human remaining, and which do not know any moment of light. In a preparation for war, which must not be only material, but also spiritual, it is necessary to recognize all of this with a clear and unflinching gaze in order to be able to orient souls and energies towards the higher solution, the only one which corresponds to the ideals from which fascism draws its inspiration. Fascism appears to us as a reconstructive revolution, in that it affirms an aristocratic and spiritual concept of the nation as against both socialist and internationalist collectivism, and the democratic and demagogic notion of the nation. In addition, its scorn for the economic myth and its elevation of the nation in practice to the degree of warrior nation marks positively the first degree of this reconstruction, which is to resubordinate the values of the ancient castes of the merchants and slaves to the values of the immediately higher caste. The next step would be the spiritualization of the warrior principle itself. The point of departure would then be present to develop a heroic experience in the sense of the highest of the three possibilities mentioned above. To understand how such a higher spiritual possibility, which has been properly experienced in the greatest civilizations that have preceded us, and which, to speak the truth, is what makes apparent to us their constant and universal aspect, is more than just studious erudition. This is what we will deal with in our following writings, in which we shall focus essentially on the traditions peculiar to ancient and medieval Romanity.